So Michael feels that um, in order to get through the lab exercises, it would be wiser to put lab one and lab two exercises together. So he's going to go through the lecture lab of module two, and then we're going to have a combined lab that doesn't have a break so that when there's problems, that, um, we have an extended period of time to address those problems. Yeah, my, my concern was simply that we break for lunch at 12.30. And so I figured this, this next lecture will probably be about 20 to 30 minutes long. And then that'll give us a full hour to basically work together on labs one and two. And so for those of you that feel like you want to go ahead, all the instructions are provided there so you can go ahead. For those of you that want to learn more about what we're actually doing for each step, you can basically stay in sync with me. And so... I've already started. Okay, so if you bear with me, there's just one more lecture before, before lunch, and so we'll talk about the flip side. Basically, now that you have your wonderful alignments, what do you do now? And so most commonly what you want to do is you want to identify small variants. Um, and the way I've broken down this talk is into five main sections. Uh, just a basic introduction of what variant calling is all about. Then we're going to talk about the variant calling pipeline. Um, just, like what, just like we had a BAM file format for the alignments, we now have a standardized file format for variants called VCF. Um, now, one of the big tricks when you're doing variant calling is how do you reduce your false positives and false negatives? Um, so we're going to talk about how can you filter your data so that what you end up with is the most true uh, data set that you can. And then Whereas normal variant call filtering is often very linear, you're, you're setting thresholds for different parameters. Um, there's sort of a new style that people are, are doing called dynamic filtering, so we'll talk about a GATK tool called VQSR. So what is small variant discovery? Basically what you're trying to find is, in a, in a piece of DNA, you're trying to find where you have in some cases, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Some cases you have indel. So in this case, we have a, you know, a, a two base pair A insertion. Now, originally when I started with variant discovery, um, my master's thesis project was to create a SNP collar. And at that time, I had some biology friends, but I had a whole bunch of computer science friends. And I was trying to describe what my project was to them. And so I said, I'm trying to look at a bunch of sequences and try and find out what's different about these sequences from a reference genome. And all my computer science friends just looked at me and like, God, that's so boring. So you basically wrote diff for sequences. A diff is a Unix command that basically identifies what the differences are between two files. And I was like, no, no, it's not that. We basically have added complexity. In your DNA sequences, you're gonna have these sporadic mismatches. And those are probably sequencing errors. But then you're also going to have potentially true events. So in this example, at this location here, it looks like we have an AG heterozygous SNP. So the trick for a, 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 like a SNP caller is to try and you know, weed these out and not be fooled by these sequencing errors and look for these true events. And so the very earliest SNP callers, what they did is they looked at the base qualities and so if the top side basically represented the, the base quality for the bases in the reference and the bottom showed the, the base qualities for the reads, in this case, <coughs> the, both the reference and the read had a very high base quality. And so with this high base quality discrepancy, you're more likely to believe that this might be a SNP if all you had was one read. Uh, in this case, basically you have a low quality situation where both the read and the genome have a very low uh, base quality. And in that case, it's kind of a crapshoot. From one read, you wouldn't be able to really make a decision one way or the other if this is a potential SNP site or not. Now, so, oh, it's, been, it's been a while now. It's been like 10 years since we've started using Bayesian equations to try and figure out, you know, is this site polymorphic or not? And so there's going to be a test at the end of the lecture on what's going on here. <laughs> Nah, just kidding. But in this Bayesian scaffold, it's taking into account, you know, what are the base qualities involved? 
you know, what were the allele calls that were present. Um, you have some prior probabilities about the, the different genotypes here. Um, and the true definition, or the, the most accepted definition of what a SNP is, is that you're trying to find a single nucleotide polymorphism that's at least 1%, has a 1% allele frequency in a population. So that's what this is addressing. You know, what, you know what, what is the number of people that you're looking at when you're doing your SNP discovery? And then this is just normalizing everything that was on the top. So if you want to get it down to right technical, a SNP is if you're doing variant calling and you have a population of individuals. The less aesthetically pleasing sounding acronym SNV is, is what you would call if you only have one sample or if you're doing something like tumor normal um, variant discovery. Oh yes, oh yes. And some of the things that you have to take into account uh, when you're doing variant calling is you have different ploidy, so you'll have haploid and diploid individuals. Um, in some cases, you're going to have pool DNA. So for example, if you're, if you're sequencing the human genome and you end up looking at the mitochondrial alignments, that is pooled. That's not gonna be haploid or diploid whereas the Y chromosome would be a haploid example. This is a slide that was taken from the Thousand Genomes pilot paper, and I won't go into detail about these data sets, but basically what we're showing here on the Y axis is what percentage of the variants were not discovered. So basically what we're showing here is the false negative rate. And on the X axis, we're showing how many samples were sequenced, so how many individuals in the population. So the big take home message in this slide is, you know, for the first 100 samples or so that you do variant calling on, basically you can reduce your false negative rate uh, quite a lot. So basically in this case, false negative rate means the, the chance of finding those variants in a single individual. But after a while, that basically evens out, that basically plateaus. So going, you know, if you were to add another 300 individuals to this case, you probably wouldn't be able to discover too many more variants that you discovered when you had 300 individuals. So that's more experimental design than actually what you would be doing with a variant caller, but equally important. So let's talk a little bit about the variant calling pipeline. And what we have here is this is, this is from the, the Nielsen paper uh, in, from 2011. And these first three steps are basically what we discussed uh, about an hour ago about alignment. So the first steps are base calling, read mapping, and then here we have duplicate removal and indel realignment, even base quality recalibration. And then what we see here is we see two distinct little workflows for if you were trying to do variant calling in a population, or if you were trying to do variant calling with just one individual. So that's what Francis was just talking about, that. In some cases, you have two different types of variant calling pipelines, depending on what your situation is. But what's common to both of them at the end is you're going to be refining your data set. You're going to be filtering uh, your variant calls. And that's what we have down here. And then they even mention uh, genotype quality score recalibration. This is an interesting slide from Mark DePristo's group. Uh, that, that basically it coincides with what I was talking about in the computational resources argument. As we go through these pipelines, you sort of lose more and more data. You sort of aggregate or, or boil it down to the original stuff. So in this, in this example, we're assuming all the alignment has been done. And so for a 30, 30x genome, human genome, uh, you might have BAM files that total about 200 gigabytes. And so basically these are BAM files. You might have recalibrated duplicate removal now at that point, you're going to use a variant caller. So it could be SAM tools, TATK, um, the lab that Aaron and I used to be at, they have a, a, base caller, uh, a variant caller called Freebase right now uh, in England. Uh, Cortex is a pretty popular variant caller as well. Um, and so, you know, the variant callers for that kind of data might take up to about 10 hours. The resulting VCF file is much smaller in size. So basically, you've gone from 200 gigabytes to one gigabyte. Um, but at this point, you have to either manually curate 
And so this is what Mark DePisto's group calls expert user judgment. That could take days. I mean, if you had you know, full-time people investigating every single variant call, trying to figure out, is it believable? Often in expert user judgment, you're going to have some sort of round of validations. Um, alternatively, or in conjunction with, you could have variant filtration. And that usually takes about 30 minutes for this kind of, this amount of data. And so what you end up with is still yet about a gig of variants, but basically these have been filtered. You might be doing some additional analysis like segregating the haplotypes, um, et cetera, and, and trying to remove machine and alignment artifacts. Any questions on this slide? All right, the VCF file format. If you thought SAM file format was hairy, I got one to top it. So the VCF file format is, is uh, a text format. And if we look at each entry, basically the order looks like this. The very first field is going, going to be your chromosome. So in this case, it was chromosome 20. The next field is position. ID, that's, that's typically like a, a DB SNP reference ID. So in this case, this particular uh, variant had this RSID. Then you have this G represents what is the base at the reference. So the reference had a G here, and in this case, we found in our sample there was an A. 29 represents the quality. So this is the, the variant score. Then you have what's called a filter field. So right now it says pass. If it says pass or if it has a dot in it, that means this is a good variant as, as far as we know. If it says anything else, that usually means, well, that means it's filtered. Uh, so I'll say like low quality or, or any number of things. And then we have a very long string here. And this is called the info field. Now the info field can can hold things like, in this example, we have something encoding how many samples were involved, uh, what was the combined depth, so here we had 14x coverage, what was the allele frequency, was it in DB SNP, was it in HapMap2. Some of these fields here are pretty non-standard nowadays. The next slide shows some, uh, some typical fields that we'll see in GATK. After that, we have what's called the genotype format. So basically, this is telling all the remaining data that we have what, what do the fields actually mean? So the first one is the genotype. GQ is genotype quality. DP is read depth. And HQ is the haplotype qualities. And so just like what we said, we said we were going to have three samples. We're listing three individual calls here. Now when you look at this genotype, you see a 1 and a 0. And you're like, what the heck is that? I was looking for a G and an A. Well, I can explain that better on the next slide. So this next slide is basically showing the entry, but it's, it's describing it more, more in a, a vertical fashion. So again, we have the position here, and then we have the reference allele and the variant allele. And the way they do this is they number all the alleles in the order that they were shown. So the reference allele always gets number zero. And then the first variant allele gets one. If you have multiple variant alleles, they'll get two, three, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so later on, when you look at the genotypes here, if you see a 0 slash 1, what does that mean? Well, that means we have an AG heterozygote. Uh, what, what I like about this slide is it also explains some of the more typical fields that you'll get when you're running GATK. So in this case, we have like the number of chromosomes carrying the allele, um, allele frequency, uh, QD is basically the quality score divided by depth. You know, we, we have all the descriptions here. And so as you can guess, there's, there's the potential to put a whole bunch of data into these VCF files. And it can get pretty complex to try and parse those. Uh, there, I didn't actually write it in this presentation, but there's a, a tool out there that can make your life really easy. It's called VCF Tools. So if you want to do any sort of analysis or filtering or, or look at, you know, event intersections between two different um, data sets, you can download VCF tools and that will help you do that. <coughs>
we are not. It, yes, yes, for the stuff that we're doing there, yeah. Yes, Michelle. <laughs> As you command. <laughs> Yeah, so, so no, that's, that's a very good question. And in fact, um, for the eagle-eyed people in here, there's actually two variant scores in, in essence. You have this variant score here, this 29, which is qual. And then you also have for each of these genotype fields, you have a genotype quality. So what's different? So the variant score, this first one, basically answers the question, what is the probability that at this site there's a variant. The genotype quality that you see here basically answers what is the probability that the genotype is correct. So basically you were saying it's an AG. So it's, it's, it's a different type thing. But here we get into what my pet peeve with all variant callers are. So we talked about what, what scale we're doing things on. Like a base quality of 20 meant there was a 1% error rate. 30 meant 0.1%. Technically, these variant scores obey the same scale. But when you look at like GATK or any other variant caller, you get these obscenely high numbers. I've seen variant scores like 3,000 or 10,000. When you start thinking about how infinitesimally small that error rate would be, that would be like you could sequence until the heat death of the universe and you could never really know with that kind of precision. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of one thing that I'm hoping that I can possibly affect in my, my stuff that I'm doing at Illumina to sort of correct those variant scores in the future, but that's a very good question about you know, what do those variant scores actually, actually mean. So there's a very good document, and this one I actually do have listed on the wiki page, called the GATK Best Practices. And it's, it's not actually in the slides, it would actually be on the, on the wiki page. Um, but in the Best Practices document, it has all sorts of advice on how would you go about doing, creating a variant calling experiment. But towards the end of that, it starts talking about, um, it starts talking about what kind of filters would get you the, the best bang for the buck. And so the, the info fields that it concentrates on are these following ones. So again, QD was the variance score divided by depth. Um, you can have a haplotype score. You know, what, what are the consistency of the site for two segregating, uh, se segregating haplotypes? MQ rank sum, that looks at the mapping quality. Read position rank sum, I think, is pretty interesting. That basically downweights. You know, for sequencing technologies like Illumina, where you tend to get the sequencing errors towards the ends of the read, this rank sum basically negatively weights. If, if all your evidence for a mutation come from just the ends of some reads, then maybe you don't want to believe it as much as if you had found it towards the beginning or, or in this case, towards the middle of the read. Um, FS, that's the Fisher's exact test for strand bias. Again. What you'd like to see is, if you're looking at a bunch of alignments, you'd like to see a fairly equal number of reads in the forward direction as in the reverse direction. If you see any bias, that'll be reflected here. MQ is another variation of, of reporting mapping quality. They recommend something called inbreeding coefficient. Now that one is only applicable if you're sequencing 10 or more individuals. And, and I just find that in practice, I'm, I'm usually never varying calling that many samples at once. So that one sort of becomes uninteresting. And then finally, DP is the total unfiltered depth across all samples. So in the, in the GATK filters, they, they can sort of use all these info fields to figure out, OK, let's weed out the potential false positives. So let's talk about that some more. We, we already talked about how you can use trios. Um, trios are pretty powerful. We used that in the Thousand Genomes project when we released the variant calls for uh, the European trio and the Yoruban trio. They screened out every time they detected there was a potential trio conflict, they just threw out that variant call from the candidate data set. So that's one way of reducing 
false positives. Then again, there is a certain de novo mutation rate. So do that at your own uh, oh, folly. What's interesting is males have a seven times higher de novo mutation rate. Um, another thing that you can do is you can use imputation. Again, this is taken from 1,000 genomes data set, but what's important about this is that the 1,000 genomes data set, we had a low coverage um, project, and then we had a high coverage ex uh, exome project. And what was amazing about it is the low coverage guys, and when we're talking low coverage, it was between 4x and 6x coverage across the genome. But because they had many more individuals and they could then use imputation, what we're showing here is on the x-axis is the number of genotype calls, on the y-axis is the number of incorrect variants. The error rate is actually astonishingly very similar, even though we had such little coverage uh, with the with this uh, low coverage project. And so that basically shows the power of imputation. Even though you had all odds against you, you could basically equal the odds by, by using imputation to, to figure out what the, the proper call would be. Um, as an example, imputation could potentially give you, tell you what the, the variant is in your data set, even if you have zero coverage in that location. And that's, that's a pretty powerful thing to, uh, to, to see. Um, another, another way of looking at imputation, this was a study where they looked at using GATK, and so the blue line represents if you just use GATK on one sample, the red line is if you used it on multiple samples. So you see, using multiple samples with GATK, you get a, a somewhat higher genotype accuracy. But the top line, they basically pair GATK up with Beagle, with, with, which is a, an imputation program, and you see that the power Basically, the, the genotype call accuracy increased quite a lot when they did that. Another thing a lot of people do when they're trying to look at variant calls, and this is um, kind of specific for human, at least in the case of HapMath, dbSNP, however, will be apl applicable for, for all your fish lovers here and, you know, populist lovers. Um, so basically, the, if you look at which variants overlap with half map, um, you can get sort of an idea for what is your false negative rate. So half map basically, um, they identified variants every 2 KB or so, but these are very easy to find variants, and they're sort of divided according to populations. And so if you don't find that half map SNP for your population, that might be an indicator that you're not sensitive enough to find um, those SNPs. If you take it on the flip side, dbSNP seems to have everything and the kitchen sink in it. And so if you have a large number of variants that are new that are not in dbSNP, that might be an indicator that you have a potential large fraction of your variants are false positives. And for dbSNP, you have <coughs> SNPs for all sorts of different organisms. So that, that, one's, that one's good to use. We mentioned before, some people can look at coverage. So in this case, what they've done is they've color-coded the coverage across a chromosome. Um, for red, represents the coverage for all the SNPs that overlapped with HapMap. Blue for all the other SNPs. And so basically, you see these well-characterized SNPs seem to have a basic coverage. Of course, here you have the centromeres. Um, and so basically, if you were to look at this, you might, you might say, okay, well, I'll place a filter here. Anything that has less than this X coverage, I might remove, and anything that has more than this much coverage, I might remove. Uh, same thing. Um, remember that very first slide we showed in the alignment um, Indel cleaning uh, slide? Basically, it showed that we had potentially a lot of SNPs in one location, but then after we did the indel realignment, it all cleaned up and it became just one deletion. Well, so one of the, the QC metrics that you can look at is what is the distance between your SNPs? So in this case, you now what is the fraction of SNPs that are really close to each other? And what you can do with that is if you find clusters of SNPs that are really close to each other, maybe you want to ignore those. So that becomes a good filter. Um, we're a number of people here that uh, had a, a nice background in population genetics. You can basically look for 
uh, Hardy Weinberg violations and basically use that uh, to create a filter. Um, other people, they just place thresholds. At the end of the day, when you use a variant color, you get a variant score. And the variant score is basically what is the probability that a site is polymorphic. Uh, so you could place a threshold. I want a variant score of at least this much before I believe it. Um, a lot of people, they, they use the transition transversion ratios um, to optimize or to figure out how well they're doing. This is controversial in my opinion because what a lot of people will do is they'll, they'll start tweaking their filters until they start getting a transition transversion ratio in humans of about 2 or 2.1. Well, 2 or 2.1, you know, where do those, does that number come from? And it doesn't actually apply equally well. You know, intergenic regions have a different ratio than, than some coding regions. And so this is, this is sort of a, more of a, a rule of thumb than, than something that, that you should strive for. But a lot of people do use that ratio. Yeah? Sorry, again, rookie question. <laughs> so if you're working, if you're interested in regions of the genome that are under really strong selection, by doing all of this, I mean, I know you try, I mean, you've got so much data, you've got to figure out a way to, it's not going to be perfect, but you're trying to clean it up as fast as possible. But by doing this, you're essentially right off the bat potentially eliminating some very cool Exactly, exactly. So, so what I'm presenting here is basically a vast array of what people have done in the past. Yeah. This is not an implicit recommendation that this is how you should go about doing it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the example here that we showed, these info fields, mm -hmm. in, in today's lab, we're actually only going to use three of these info fields to filter our SNPs. So we're going to use the ones that I have put in bold. So QD, FS, and MQ. <laughs> so QD is the variance score divided by depth. Uh -huh. FS was the Fisher's exact test for strand bias. And then MQ was the root mean square of the mapping quality. So those are the three things that we're going to look at today to filter our, our SNPs. Oh, great, thanks. Yeah. That was a catchy jingle. All right. So we've talked about a whole bunch of potential filters. But the question remains, how do you combine these different filters in a meaningful way? And so this slide was also taken from Mark DePristo's group. Here they're showing that they're actually tracking three different things at one time. Uh, so as they're tweaking these filters, so basically, or, or, or basically they're looking at the, the number of SNPs in a data set. So as, as they look at these, different SNPs, they're tracking the DB SNP rate, the transition transversion ratio, and the number of SNPs that overlap with um, an Omni chip, basically a SNP chip. And by using this, you can basically decide where is the appropriate cutoff rate for whatever filters you were using. But the next slide pretty much shows what I'm getting at. And that is, if, if you're putting together a pipeline, you might have a couple of liners that you're interested in. So in this case, let's say you had BWA and you wanted to use GATK with it. Let's say you also had bow tie and SEM tools. In both of the, these cases, because the aligner is different, you might need different variant calling filters for each of these cases. Um, so in this case, it's two different variants of, of filters that you would need. But it gets more complex. Let's say you wanted to use bow tie with GATK or BWA with SAM tools. Basically, you have some more stuff. Let's say you had different coverage of experiments. Somebody's doing exome sequencing and somebody's doing you know, low, low coverage and somebody's just doing normal genomic resequencing at 30x. Each of these will have a different set of filters that might be required. Even then, the actual run qualities might be different. You might have like a new tech that comes in that day to run your, to, to do your run for you. And you get a very low Q30 percentage, basically a low, a low quality data set. Whereas your experienced lab tech member might produce these pristine runs for you. In both of these cases, you might have to trim those filters a little bit. So you can see there's a large number of filters that you might have to consider. And then, if you start adding more aligners and more variant colors, you just get frustration and rage 
And so that's where I want to introduce, there's this GATK program called the Variant Quality Recalibrator, or Variant Quality Score Recalibrator, VQSR. And what that one does is it sort of dynamically looks at different filters. It tries to look at the actual data set you have, and then you basically say, hey, I want you to look at these three info fields. Maybe you can find the pro appropriate thresholds for that. And so what happens here on the x-axis, we're showing one of those parameters. Uh, we mentioned QD before, which was variant quality divided by depth. And on this y-axis, we're basically showing evidence for strand bias. So that would be that FS. And what they're noticing is everything that overlaps with half map is, is blue. So these are potentially good variants here when you're looking at this 2D chart. And everything in red is everything that doesn't overlap with half map. So these are potentially bad. And so VQSR, what it does is it tries to learn where are all the good variants. So it starts using the expectation maximization algorithm to try and figure that out, does some clustering. And then what it does is for each variant, it assigns a probability for how well it clustered. And then what it does is it takes the worst 3% of those variants to figure out, okay, where are all the worst results? And it clusters all those together. What you end up with is something that looks like this. So everything now in green is accepted as, oh, these are potentially good variants. And everything here in, in, uh, in purple in this case are the variants that look the most anomalous. These are the ones that you wanted to filter out. But what's cool about this is because you've done all the clustering and everything um, with this particular data set, it doesn't matter if you had a low, a low quality or a high quality, a low coverage or a high coverage data set it's learning what the appropriate thresholds are for each of those clusters. So another example, if, if you look at this in a classical histogram fashion, here we're showing this QD parameter. And so here is varying amounts of varying quality over depth. And here is just a histogram, the number of SNPs. And what they notice is these, these SNPs overlap. The ones in the blue overlap with DB SNP. The ones in red are novel. And basically you see, well, you know, maybe if you place a threshold here, that's probably a good, a good filter. So it, it's dynamic filtering. And if you were to look at this over across an entire chromosome, you see that all the, the blue dots are retained variants and all the red ones are screened out. And again, you see, because you might have higher coverage in the centromeric regions, those would be the ones that you filter the heaviest on. So you see there's a heavy red band over here and some, some over here as well. So to summarize this, uh, pre-processing is key. Basically the steps we talked about in the previous uh, discussion, uh, duplicate marking, indel realignment, and base quality recalibration will all contribute to make your variant, qual uh, variant calls that much more robust. Uh, we have a standardized file format. It can be pretty hairy. It's very intimidating the first time you look at it. It's actually very intimidating the first 10 times you look at it, but eventually it all sinks in and it all makes sense. Um, and then to improve your results, there's a number of um, fields that you can filter and you can optionally look at dynamic filtering. Now for today's lab, um, we're not actually doing the dynamic filtering because what I've done is for the sake of time, I've picked a very small region of the human genome, just 300 KB, so that we can actually align in time. That way nobody misses lunch, basically, is what I'm saying. But because you have such few data points, um, the one drawback with this dynamic filtering approach with VQSR is you need lots and lots of data points. Um, so VQSR won't actually work well with the data set we're looking at today, so we'll, we'll be applying manual filtering. Questions on the talk? No? So since I'm going to subject you guys to one whole block of, of a lab, what, how do you, so, so now I'll be like Michelle, how do you guys feel about like a 10-minute break before we actually start the lab?
That's a good, I like that taste. <laughs> So, in the virtual machine, you need to have a wiki open. You should probably open up the text files associated with the wiki so you can copy and paste the command. Yeah. All that. But you can click She is quite correct. <laughs> feel free to log in, and when you feel pretty safe there, go grab some refreshments. <laughs>